So thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk about uh, our work uh, here today. I want to um, talk a little bit about what's new about the drug that we're studying, because it's really based on very new science, uh, and it's a very interesting hypothesis, we think. And so I do want to spend a few minutes at a high level trying to explain to you uh, what it's about. So this drug is designed to address a new hypothesis about the cause of ALS. It blocks the inflammation in nerve cells in the brain and spinal cord before it starts. So I think you're all aware that to some extent inflammation is an important component of the pathology of this disease. And we're interested in trying to block that and prevent it. The drug is an oral capsule. It's taken once a day. So uh, simple to take in that respect. It's already been studied in over 200 people, healthy volunteers and patients with other illnesses and found to have a very good safety profile. And as I said, we're studying, and as Lisa mentioned, this is a phase two study in people living with ALS who have the C9 ORF72 mutation. And I'll explain a little bit also about why we're interested in that particular population, at least for now. So here's the, a bit of the science behind it. As you all know, uh, our cells have DNA in the nucleus, and that DNA is the blueprint for the cell to make essential proteins. To make the proteins, the DNA gets activated and then it gets con uh, made into RNA and other, uh, and then into the proteins. A lot of the DNA in our cells has no function. And if this DNA gets activated and goes through that same process, it can produce products that can be harmful to the cell. So to prevent this from happening, what cells have developed over millions of years of evolution is a way to prevent this non-functional DNA from getting activated. And one of the things that it does is it winds the DNA tightly around proteins called chromatin. And that's what I've illustrated in the picture here. So you can see the DNA blue strands are tightly wound around these per proteins uh, that together are what we call chromatin. And in this state is known as heterochromatin. What happens in ALS? In ALS, this harmful DNA can get activated. And the way that that happens, I think you're all also familiar with the fact that most ALS, in fact, almost all ALS is associated with a problem in a protein called TDP43. One of the functions of this protein is to help the cell to keep the harmful DNA from being activated. So it works together with this chromatin uh, and other proteins to keep this harmful DNA from being in a, in a state that can be activated. When the, in ALS, when the TDP43 no longer functions properly, the DNA can unwind from the heterochromatin, as you see here, and it can therefore be in a state that is susceptible to activation. What happens when that occurs? it leads to inflammation. And the way that that happens is through several steps. The DNA is converted into RNA. It's then made into other proteins. Those proteins can make the, the RNA turn back into DNA and the cell recognizes this DNA as harmful. And so it mounts an immune response to it, similar to the immune response that a cell would mount to a virus. And as a result of that immune response, the cells become inflamed and that damages the cells. So it's a several step process, but it leads to the neuroinflammation of ALS and ultimately to the neurodegeneration, the loss and damage to cells. What TDP 101 does is it blocks one of the key steps in this process. So by blocking that step, the subsequent steps don't happen and the inflammation doesn't happen and the neurodegeneration doesn't happen. How do we know that this is what's happening? If I just go back for a moment, we know that these steps are happening because if you see those products there, one, two, and three, we can measure some of those, both in animal models of disease uh, and also in the brains of patients at um, autopsy, patients who have, uh, who've died, we can measure that. So, sorry. yeah, so, that's how we know that this is a process that does go on in, in ALS. And in animal models, 
drugs like TPN-101 can block this process and lead to lower amounts of those harmful proteins. The reason that we're studying the C9 mutation is just again, very briefly, there's two reasons. The C9 mutation makes the TDP43 dysfunction worse. And also one of the normal fun functions of C9 is to tamp down inflammation in the cell. So if you get a viral infection, when the infection has been cleared, C9 protein reduces the inflammation that was there so it doesn't go on forever and, and damage the cells. When the infection's over, it stops. Here, that doesn't happen because of the dysfunctional C9. So that's one reason why we think that T TPN 101 might be especially good for ALS that's due to the C9 mutation. However, if this study that we're currently doing is successful, later we may expand to other forms of ALS, including other familial forms and sporadic ALS, because the TDP43 problem will still be there. So a little bit about the study. We're gonna include 40 participants. People with ALS and the C9 mutation are eligible, but if they also have frontotemporal dementia, which as you know, does occur uh, in patients, uh, people with ALS, uh, they're, all, they're still eligible. It is a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial for the first six months, but 60% will get the active drug TPN-101 and only 40% the placebo. And after six months, everyone can get the TPN-101 for six more months. We, we're doing a large number of evaluations, some very specialized blood tests in order to check for those levels of things that I already told you about to see if we're reducing those markers of inflammation and of neurodegeneration, but also the standard clinical scales uh, that are used to evaluate people living with ALS. We are doing uh, lumbar punctures, uh, again, because to measure some of those components, it's important to look in the CSF, the, the compartment that's closest to the brain. So before and after treatment, we do do uh, a lumbar puncture, but the drug is, is taken orally. So if you wanna learn more, um, you can get in touch with us. The uh, operational person working on the study is Jay Soto. His number is here. We have a um, email address that you can write to, to uh, and we'll send you more information about the study. Or if you know how to look on clinicaltrials.gov, which is the NIH website that maintains information about clinical trials, you can look there. If you search just for either TPN 101 or here is our NCT number. And this information, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that the people at Everything ALS will provide all this to you if you would, if you express an interest. Uh, of course, you can get in touch with us directly, uh, but we hope that uh, this little presentation has given you a feel for, for what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, and the study is underway. Uh, we have an, a number of sites already up and running in the United States. There's gonna be probably about 15 sites in the US altogether working on this trial. Uh, we're also doing the trial in a few countries in Europe, but I know that uh, this audience is American. So if, I, if there is a minute or two for questions, I'd be happy to take them. Yeah, Dr. Satlin, my name is Sarah. I'm one of the other Everything ALS team members. I'm gonna read you a couple questions from the chat. Um, the first one says, you talked about how people with the C9 genetic mutation can be part of the trial without having the official ALS diagnosis yet. Um, is there a possibility that this will be for prophylaxis for C9 carriers? Yeah, no, it, currently it is not. Um, it, patients, um, pe people do have to have ALS at this point to be in this trial, because it's the first trial that we're doing uh, in any of these disorders. So um, it's important that the people do have clinical symptoms that we can measure because we do want to see whether there's going to be a clinical improvement. Uh, this is not a drug that would only prevent progression of ALS. It, we hope it will do that, but because of it's reducing the inflammation associated with the disease, we also have the hope that it will improve some symptoms, and we want to at least see if we can get some sense of that uh, with this first trial. Later, anything is open. It could be possible for prophylactic treatment. Uh, as I said, it could be in 
populations that don't have the C9 mutation, uh, sporadic or, or even other genetic forms, but that's all, that's all for the future. Okay, and then the other question is besides the C9 um, eligibility, is there any other qualifications or disqualifications for, to be in the study? Uh, there are, but they're not many. Um, if the symptoms have been present for, I think it's more than three years, then um, that would be uh, excluded. Uh, you know, um, people have to be otherwise, in general, good health. Uh, it's important that they be able to swallow the capsules uh, also. Uh, but apart from that, no, there's not a lot of uh, specific exclusions that would limit uh, people being able to go into this trial. Okay. Um, wonderful. Well, we will make sure to um, share your information and then others can reach out to you guys with either questions or um, interest if they uh, potentially qualify. And we want to say thank you for, for giving us this presentation and all the information. And we are excited to see how the TPN 101 um, study goes in the future. Thank you so much. And thank you to everybody listening.